All right. Thank you, Scary Machine. So let's go back to the share screen. So I am supposed to be in dialogue, correct? I think that's the one Zoom said. Yay, thank you. Um, I'm going to attempt to keep the chat somewhere off to the side here so I can actually read it, but we'll see how this goes. Also, not sure how Zoom's working with, ah, I just click on it, it's fine. Toolbar's all up in my way, it's all good. Alrighty, so welcome. Uh, I'm glad you could join us. This is about dialogue and how to create Good dialogue that sounds natural. Uh, early beginning writers. Oh, I'm supposed to show off the fancy shirt. This is the merchandise shirt. Um, good dialogue is something that pretty much every book needs. It makes or breaks your book along with your plots. I mean, characters have to be likable too. But you'll find out through this presentation that Character development and the likability factor has a lot to do with the dialogue you give them, the lines they're saying, um, the lines they're thinking. Uh, I kind of count thought dialogue like to yourself as part of it. So I'm just going to wrap that up in one. <clears throat> so what makes good dialogue? Well, it's going to have good flow. It's going to give your character a voice and a personality. It's going to help uh, shape the world that you're building. Uh, feel free to stick in any questions you have in the chat. This is actually a relatively short presentation, I believe, uh, but I should leave a lot of lot time here for uh, your questions as well. Apparently the left and right buttons don't work, so I'm going to do the clicky thing. It also will uh, tell something about the characters in the surrounding areas. It'll tell us about characters who aren't in the scene per se. Uh, it'll contain details where possible. That one you got to be cautious with because there is such a thing as info dumping, which is where you're using the dialogue to just dump information on your readers, and that gets annoying real quick. Um, humor where appropriate. Uh, certain characters need it. Certain characters, uh, the absence of it is part of their personality. Um, also where appropriate, meaning what is actually happening to them is the situation that they're in something that would warrant uh, humor. So this one goes back to the flow. What do I mean by flow? I mean uh, talking about the natural rhythm of speech. It's not always very formal, although there are certain characters where you do have a lot of formality um, and that again becomes part of the personality and you want it to be that way. Um, the one I can think of offhand is Nadine. I don't know if any of you have read Mind Your Project um, or Dustin's Decisions because Nadia becomes Nadine later. Uh, her speech pattern is a lot stiffer than a lot of people because uh, that's just how she developed as a character. She's a minder, so she has a lot of deep thoughts and is very formal as a person. So mm -hmm. that's where that came from. Well, there's a back and forth. Uh, you'll notice in your own conversations with people that you you know you might have planned to say one thing, but you end up saying something else based on what somebody else does or says or um, something else that happens around you. You need to adjust to whatever the moment is, and that is true for your characters as well. So there's a natural back and forth. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Although. Uh, I will say there is there is something to be said for skipping the general pleasantries. You don't always want to spend your limited page space going with the, hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I mean, there is a spot for that, but that is not uh, what you want to do with every single conversation. Yes, I do a lot of characters with the Southern accent. I do a lot of characters, uh, sorry, the question on the table is any thoughts on slang or dialects in dialogue, uh, dropping the G's to sound more country. I, it, I go either way on that. I think some of them I had replaced the uh, G with an apostrophe, but 
then I think as I went on, I just left the G in and then described it as a Southern accent so that when somebody's saying it or when a narrator is handling it, they can figure out they need to kind of drop the G sound, but it is in writing still. That's a good question. Uh, there are a lot of, I, I don't do too many accents. Uh, I do Southern and I do British. Although I would say uh, British is usually just a matter of uh, picking out a few different word choices. Um, other than that, it's pretty much general standard English. Um, there's start, there's stops, there's interruptions. Uh, as with anything, it's everything in moderation, and you want to kind of mix up what you're doing. Uh, that alone gives it a natural flow. I mean, I, the picture I have here is cliche, but it's a, of a river. They do follow a specific pattern, but they also kind of go where they want. It's true for rivers, it's true for, you know, if there's a rock there, it'll flow around it. Um, if there's an interruption, your characters need to adjust in some way. That could be in their head, that could be what they're saying aloud, that could be an observation they make. But I count that all as part of dialogue because I count anything with uh, descriptions in between as part of your dialogue, um, if it's not a straight up just intro portion to your story. There's the level of intensity, and that, again, is all part of shaping the mood that you're trying to create. Uh, and then I guess your, your major check is, does this sound normal? Does it sound like a normal person? There's sometimes repetition. There's sometimes, uh, a lot of times there's fragments. Uh, people start and stop in the middle, or, you know, good friends, they have inside jokes, they have... Um, they don't have the need for the hi, how are you all the time because they have a familiarity, fil Ooh, that's a hard word. familiarity with the specific person. Uh, I meant by interruptions, you mean like paragraphs in between the dialogue sometimes, uh, but I was actually more referring to uh, interrupting another character uh, as part of their speech. You, don't always wait for somebody to finish their sentence, especially if it's high energy, high uh, emotion in a scene. Uh, sometimes you're not going to wait for this person to finish whatever they're saying, especially if they're in the midst of threatening you or a loved one or whatever. But I'm sure uh, interruptions can be interpreted several ways as well. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm going to have to move this lovely preview to the other side because it's all been my words. Okay, so the character's personality and circumstances, they are going to affect your vo the voice of that character. I spend a lot of time in this in the Five Steps book on dialogue. I, it's not a general sales pitch. There is a link at the end for you to grab the book funnel version if you so desire. Um, but I was noticing as I was building this presentation that there's a lot of information that like each one of these, I've mainly pulled out the headers to things, but there's a lot of information under each one's kind of picking out the differences. So dialogue is the easiest tool, I think, to be able to tell uh, real quick who your character is and what the other characters in the story feel about him or her and just establishing that you know baseline this character stands for this this and this or going the other way if they're confused on who they are what they are what they're going to discover um, if they're going to be some development from the beginning to the end you may change the dialogue pattern there's one thing um one of my stories it started as a series of short stories um with this character's girl named Jillian and she's a dream shaper. And what happened was I had written that the short story is about two years before I started on what became the um, Debbie's Children series, which is one of my sci-fi young adult ones. Uh, I point that out because somebody in one of the reviews or in feedback or something had said the character's voice changed. And I found, you know, that's okay in this situation because I had developed as a writer, but not only that, the character had developed because 
the original stories were her at, I think, about an eight-year-old, and then she was 11, 12, 13 in the beginning of this new story. So in five years, you know, you as a person <laughs> develop a lot. So your speech patterns, it's not out of the ordinary to say, hey, this could have changed. Yes, sometimes there's talking heads. We'll get to that later. Um, talking heads, I believe, quick definition, at least, let me see if I'm understanding what you're saying, is that it's just all straight dialogue and not um, not any kind of descriptions about what's happening. You have no sense right, of the setting right. that this conversation is yeah. taking place in. Yes? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's, that's what I was seeing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, the example here, a Battle Harmon Army Ranger probably won't sound the same as a little girl who wants to ride a pony, unless he's probably taking something super fun and probably dangerous. Um, it, it's who your character is and their experience. Uh, you know, Battle Harden means they've seen some stuff <laughs> um, that affects you psychologically. So your perspective of the world changes and it, the way you speak about the world will probably also change. You know, a little kid, um, I pointed it out, I don't know in what episode of something, but uh, it was one of my nonfiction ones. But basically over the summer, uh, there's a big balloon festival in New Jersey and I got to see, because they went right by my neighborhood, uh, probably 40 plus balloons, uh, hot air balloons. And it was really neat to see, but it was also really neat to see. There was this little girl, maybe four years old, and she was just ecstatic. And she was jumping up and down and saying, you know, Daddy, do you see this one? Do you see this one? Do you see this one? But like, so I, I pointed out that it would look odd if me, 30 plus woman, uh, was doing the same thing. But for this child, that was perfect. Like that was her character. That's how she's viewing the world. This is probably the first time she's ever seen these balloons uh, in that context. Um, so I put throughout the presentation some examples of who some of my random characters are and just a quick, quick excerpt of some line that they say that kind of epitomizes, at least to me, what kind of shapes their dialogue and, and their character and how it fits one versus the other. So this one, this first one is Jillian. She's a Southern girl. She's a dream shaper. Um, in the story, the main story, she's a teenager. Uh, her speech pattern is very informal. Um, you can do this kind of quick analysis of your own characters at any given point. Um, I think it was a useful exercise to me. Um, she has a normal level of education, but it's probably not much past middle school. Uh, she's assertive. She's very opinionated. Um, and then this is one line. I'm going to start by saying, whoops. Oh, apparently my presentation moves if I scroll as well. I'm going to start by saying I don't like this, and you have a whole heap of explaining to do, I declared. Then I'm going to tell you to give me something to do, because you're getting my help whether you like it or not. That was an excerpt from Dustin's decision. But again, this one line within there, you can see a little bit of what I'm talking about in those previous bullet points of her being informal, um, her educational level, the words she's choosing aren't necessarily, you know, super high level or super low level, but they're just normal everyday speech. Uh, the next one is Clary and she's in sort of a futuristic story. She's also a billionaire's daughter and to me in this world that I have, Clary is one of the few people who gets a real tutor, uh, like a real life person. Everybody else has been moved on to you know just videos of teachers uh, saying one thing or another but she actually has real tutors. So I would guess that her speech patterns are a little more formal than a lot of people because her level of education for a normal teenager is a lot higher because she's not in a general public school. Uh, she tends to be wordy. And I think that part to me comes from her probably being alone a lot. I mean, I'm just thinking about what it's like to be a billionaire's kid. There's a lot of expectations. Her family owns one of the largest video game companies. Uh, she's expected to take it over. So all of these things kind of, to me, added up to this kind of stuff. Uh, you can read that excerpt there if you want. But my point is that it's a lot longer than some of the other lines that I've done. And all of her dialogue tends to be that way. 
unless she's actually responding to somebody. And let me move in the bargain. Settings. So the conversations you hear at a baseball game, a modern battlefield, a medieval battlefield, a royal court, they're all going to be different. And to me, the main thing that came out was the level of formality uh, and the tension, as in what is happening to those characters. So you would expect if you're at a ball game, you would you know, have a lot more casual conversations. Uh, if a character's overhearing stuff that's going on around them, maybe they're hearing the people hawking the overpriced beers or the sodas that cost 650 or whatever. Um, but if you're in a medieval court or battlefield, those aren't going to be terms you're ever seeing or hearing, unless it's like a weird time travel thing, in which case there is a place for mixing stuff up. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of writing in general, is that you get to choose what goes in your story as long as it makes sense. That was, I think we were talking the other day about research. Uh, and the things that people do and fantasy writers were like, well, I didn't feel like researching, so I made it fantasy. Uh, but there is actually a lot of stuff to look up to make sure that this does actually fit your story and your world. Anybody have any questions about setting and tension and level of formality? I'm going to pause there for a second. If not, I shall move on. Okay, cool. I guess I would ask, actually, sorry about that. Um, yeah, go for it. I would ask about, here, let me face you, face forward to you. Um, when you say tension, do you find like sentences get shorter or there's more, you know, they hang off more or like, how do you, how do you see tension in dialogue shifting the dialogue, the it speech? Could be a lot of things. Um, it mm -hmm. could be anything from, you know, there's threats being bandied back and forth. It could be, um, it could be an absence of dialogue. It could be just everything is super quiet and that's a change, an abrupt, weird change that's going to completely, you know, throw the character on their ear. Um, so it can be built up a couple different ways. Um, so I'm going to go back one page to tension. Um, I think it has a lot to do with what's going on around it, uh, although obviously the lines have to do with reacting to the environment and what's happening. Uh, so if somebody's in great danger, they're probably going to be saying way different lines than if they're by their pool relaxing, having a lovely drink. Um, if they're by the pool relaxing, having a lovely drink, and then somebody walks out of the lovely hedges carrying a gun, then that changes the mood of the scene uh, and what the person's thinking, feeling, and ultimately going to say is going to differ. So um, tension, I could actually probably build a whole nother presentation about that in general. Um, but um, I think if you want a more thorough answer, um, shoot me a private message and I will try to write something up real quick um, after the presentation and uh, so that there are more coherent thoughts. I can also pull out, see if I had any specific examples in the five step books already. Um, I'm gonna look forward to your next presentation on tension in dialogue. <laughs> no, that was great though. Thank you very much. I don't wanna derail you, so yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, this is great. It's, it's better to be interactive than just me literally reading my slides. <laughs> uh, many authors write modern speech in medieval settings. That is true. Um, with this trend, do you see a lot of people upset about archaic terms and modern medieval theme books? I actually don't read a lot of modern medieval theme books. Um, I would actually, at least within reason, uh, be behind updating the language to something more normal. Uh, and this is more of a personal preference, but it goes back to things like, like Shakespeare stories. There is a level of, you have to actually sit down and read this thing for about an hour, <laughs> at least me, uh, before you actually get an ear, an inner ear for the way these characters are seeing the world, the way, the, just because the way it's presented, because it's a couple hundred years in the past, um, and that was completely normal then, but it's odd to us now, so it takes some time. So it depends on, you know, the kind of book you're writing. Do you want it to be that heavy and intense? And most of us, if we're writing fiction, 
tend to be, I mean, there are people who write super dark stuff too, but uh, we tend to do it for entertainment value, whether it's dark light, middle of the road, but we're writing even medieval themed stuff for modern audiences. So we at least naturally update it uh, to make that make sense. I, you still gotta be cautious about what you bring in. So for example, like, I, again, going back to the off the cuff example of, unless it's a time travel book, you probably don't wanna bring baseballs into <clears throat> your medieval world. But at the same point, you want to, you know, if you're describing something, it's I, to me not a huge deal if you call it a piece of bread a piece of bread instead of whatever word would be more appropriate for a medieval setting does that make sense um question how do you punctuate an interruption um usually to me an interruption is if somebody's cut off that m dash is the end of their line so it's it's like a card game with two players. Once that happens, something else needs to happen. Usually it's somebody else's line that's interrupting them or some of the description of this happened so they stop speaking abruptly. If they're trailing off, I believe that's uh, ellipsis. But uh, if they're actually being interrupted abruptly, then it's going to come out in a, hey, and just it's, I use M dashes, but I suppose there are other ways you can do that. But to me, uh, when I see an ellipse, it's a little more gentle than a M dash. Alrighty, great questions. So this part of the presentation is just going back to the beginning of how can you make your dialogue better? So these are the five basic steps that I came up with and I was sitting down to write the book. Uh, get to know your characters, consider the character relationships, the power dynamics, and the world building, uh, try to write how people speak, use the dialogue tags wisely, um, and avoid certain mistakes. Alrighty. I realize my lovely going back and forth on this means I got to keep switching sides. So what affects how a person speaks? Uh, I actually do spend quite a few chapters on this part. I didn't realize it would be that long, but there's a lot of things that do affect how people speak. Uh, some of the basic, basic factors are going to be things like what age are they? And that goes back to my early example with the kid with the you know the hot air balloons. This kid who was four had a completely different speech pattern than me as an older person uh, who has seen this before, this not being my first time. Um, diseases, disabilities can sometimes affect um, physical characteristics, physical limitations, some injuries they've had, um, past factors uh, aside. So physical injuries, a lot of my characters for some reason get stabbed, um, but when that happens, your speech pattern does change a little bit based on are you getting healed right away or uh, is it actually a lingering injury? What's going on? So physical injury can affect how somebody's speaking. Or if they're just not used to running and then run a mile, also that physical exertion will cause a temporary change in your uh, physical uh, speech patterns. Past factors. Um, what background do they have? Their upbringing. Intelligence. So mental capacity and the ability to learn and adapt. Uh, there are people who write main characters that have disabilities. I haven't written one with a main character, but I have had a few side characters. Um, so when I was writing somebody with a Down syndrome, I looked up some YouTube videos and was listening to this girl speak who has Down syndrome uh, so that I could get used to the pattern uh, and the the way it sounds so that I could translate that accurately into my story uh, experience they've had. That goes back to like the battle hardened army ranger versus little girl looking at ponies. Um, your experience, what you've seen and felt from whatever is happening to you, a lot of us are very mean to our characters. So stuff happens to them. 
so that experience will change them in a lot of ways. Question, if someone has limitations in their speech, maybe has to search words, uh, I've heard that um uh, becomes irritating to the readers. Do you agree? Uh, any other ways to show hesitation? I usually describe hesitation. I don't stick in um and uh too often. Obviously, you hear it now, uh, but uh, thankfully, we're not characters in the book. I would avoid it where possible or use it with caution, as with anything, um, with even dialogue tags, like, you'll get my personal opinion on that later too, but like said everywhere annoys the heck out of me. So I try to mix it up a little, but anything can be overdone real quick. And I think putting in hesitations like that, um, uh, um, things like that, inserting them on purpose as a part of this person's speech pattern, I would use that cautiously. What affects how a character speaks? Um, that's an aside. I tend to write a lot of my stuff to go directly to audio. So that would probably factor in very heavily in how that comes out. And it would, I mean, if you're going for that effect of that kind of grating on your soul, uh, then use it. But you probably don't want to use it too often. And so describe a stutter rather than put it in the dialogue. Again, that comes back to what effect are you going for? I have had people put in stutter. I've put in a few stutters, but not this person always stutters every single time because that does get distracting. Um, so our goal as writers is to try to minimize that as much as possible. Um, that goes to the same point of why we don't put in things like hi, how are you, every two seconds. Yes, it happens, but we don't want to actually denote everything there just for the sake of, well, it happened. Unless I think Ulysses is the one that like describes everything in detail for like 24 hours. I didn't actually read the book. I've just heard about it. But so unless you're going for that kind of deep dive into something, my recommendation is to be gentle with these kind of, things that are harder to listen to. I think that's really good advice for lots of characters to get to know their patterns. I know when I was writing a character from Mississippi, I'm from California, spent some time on YouTube listening to accent and patterns. Yep, definitely helps. Definitely helps. So what else can affect your character's speech patterns? Uh, present factors, so their abilities, their interests, their special skills, their beliefs, their worldview, their personality, uh, situation and occasion, uh, social factors that goes into boring stuff like educational uh, factors, financial situation, social standing. Uh, going back to financial situation, if your character is worried about their next meal, they are in a different mind frame than the person who is worried about getting their next manicure or whatever the case may be. Your financials can have an impact on what concerns are running through your head at any given moment, which will go into your speech patterns. Social standings and expectations, expectations and goals, and the audience. Um, the audience, I believe that's also gonna come in back into play when I talk about power dynamics. You should realize in general, who you speak to affects the way you speak. So the voice you're hearing from me is not the one I use when I'm talking to my two-year-old niece. Uh, the voice you're hearing from me is really closer to what you hear if you are in my classroom at school, teaching my high schoolers some chemistry lesson. It's more informative, it's more, uh, it's casual, but you know, so not super high formality, but at the same time, there's a more, there is more formality than I'm just kicking back by the pool, lounging here, talking about whatever. Uh, power dynamics. I don't know if a lot of people talked about this or not. Uh, honestly, I haven't read too many nonfiction books on the topic. This is all just stuff from writing in a lot of genres. Uh, but power dynamics is who is your character speaking to? 
if they're enemies, if they're friends, if they're lovers, if they're employer, employee, if they're captor or captive, the way you address somebody is going to differ based on your relationship to them uh, and who has more power in that given relationship. And that can change. So just that second point is we adjust who we speak to, how we speak based on who we speak to. So there are different elements of your world. Um, there are friendly people, not so friendly people. There are creatures, there are plants, fungi, weirder stuff, artificial intelligence. Again, I pulled just the headers from a lot of these sections, but this holds true. I mean, I was obviously thinking sci-fi, fantasy, that kind of stuff, but we only think of world building in that context. But a lot of us, we build our own worlds. You know, a lot of thrillers are based in the real world, but a lot of more people get shot and a lot of poor people get cars crashed into and a lot more people, you know, are in high speed chases. So that is that particular world set in the real world. Uh, modern romance is set in the real world, but the way this particular cast of characters is built up is based on who they are friends with, who they're enemies with. Um, maybe not so much creatures, but you never know. Um, and when stuff set in the real world, you don't have to set up things like, well, this plant is called this and this plant is called that, but there are other things in that world that you need to describe that is still going to affect your characters and by extension, the way they speak. There are also non-living elements to any world. Uh, this is more the metaphysical stuff, so people's goals, their expectations, the requests that they have, the stakes that they're facing, uh, the biggie physical world stuff, the small immediate location stuff, um, religious, social norms, magic, or mood. Uh, not all of these points, so I'm just going to hit every single story, uh, but it could happen. Uh, sometimes you know, sometimes it's like not magic as in Harry Potter-esque magic. It's more magic of the moment. It can vary. So there are four factors that can up or lower your level of, of um, crafting something that sounds very natural. Uh, how sophisticated uh, that goes into education level and background. So. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Nadine has a much higher, uh, much more formal. Uh, the, her sophistication would be a higher on the scale than somebody like Jillian. The formality goes into that. She, Nadine, tends to be very high formality. Jillian would be very low formality. So the way they view the world and the way they speak about it is going to differ. Uh, accents. I kind of like doing the Southern accent. So that's why I tend to have it in a bunch of books. Uh, but there is, you know, that's, there are people in the world who have a Southern accent. So there are people in my stories who have a Southern accent. Uh, flow goes back to natural responses. That goes back to things like interruptions. It goes back to uh, just even adjusting what you say. So things like, you know, if I was going to talk about the next point, but then somebody brings up a good thing on here, if I was a character in a book, that would be me making an adjustment to what is going on in my environment. So the lady in the picture is what this last point refers to. Uh, people who can't see it, uh, it's kind of a fantasy setting. I'm seeing a lot of snow. I'm seeing more like an ice queen look going. So my quick example is this lady probably wouldn't be saying, yo, you want to grab a bite to eat? Huh. It's just because her level of sophistication and her level of, it looks like she's holding something that could blow up in her face or she's about to crown somebody. So those things, that situation would not call for that kind of dialogue. So you want to adjust what your people say based on what is happening. And, you know, you typically don't wear dresses like that if you're going to say, yo. Why does uh, word choice matter? Um, besides words being powerful, um, 
they do leave an impression and they do affect things like the sophistication. So I, I think I related it to money. So like normal words would be penny words and then, you know, 50 cent words would be like those really highbrow words that like nobody ever uses except for those poor 11th graders taking some test. So how do you want your characters to be seen? Do you want them to be seen as pretentious, powerful, meek, clever, manipulative, all of that, uh, you're gonna need words and to use words differently if you wanna give those impressions. If you wanna give the impression that they're angry, scared, rushed, or content, you would again, go back to your word choices and be using different words based on whatever mood you wanna set. Ah, and then we come to the great debate on dialogue tags. Anybody heard this debate already? I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but um, so there's a debate that goes on in the lovely writer world, and it's about how do you use dialogue tags? Um, I believe the main argument comes from traditional publishing. Obviously, a lot of us are indie publishing, but the traditional publishing and also the way things were done before, uh, meaning typewriters and such, uh, said is in your head usually just skipped over because people have read stuff for years and years and years and they don't think about it. So it's a good dialogue tag to know who is speaking, but we just kind of skim over it and move on. I'm, spoiler alert, team variety. Uh, and then there's, I'm also team no dialogue tag. And variety also means including said. You don't avoid said just because, you know, it's the enemy here. It's not. It's just um, you want to use everything in moderation. So if somebody is saying that they have this debate often with their daughter, uh, other people have heard of the debate. I'm a journalist and I love said. However, in fiction, my critiquing partners want an action tag. Yes. Uh, but not all the time. So let's get to it. But first, a bunny trail. So <laughs> when talking about dialogue tags in general, uh, this is just one of my pet peeves. Uh, so basic dialogue tags to me, this would be like my penny zone, uh, said, asked, replied, answered. Those are very normal tags. They're not disruptive in any way. Ones that are medium that kind of command a little more attention, things like shouted, screamed, commanded, cried, whispered, muttered, murmured, declared. Uh, and then sometimes you get crazy ones. Uh, there's exploded, expounded, exhaled, breathed. Uh, breathed is borderline crazy. And then there are insane ones that I would not recommend using as tags. I did actually hear most of these in a book I was listening to on audio and it, it was pissing me off. I was just arguing with the audio book the whole time. Uh, but insane ones are like wafted, Iterated, triumphed, demur demurred, and hailed. Those should not usually be used for dialogue tags. Again, anything in brief moderation, but in terms of intensity and how much this word kind of catches your attention, the insane ones catch your attention a lot more than something that's a basic one. So we were going back to the original part of the debate, which said said should be used everywhere because it's kind of innocuous. It's just generally, it blends into the background. Okay. Um, content mistakes. I mentioned this earlier, uh, go, going with excessive greetings or small talk. Even if we're writing 100,000 words for a book, we do not want to spend most of our time on small talk. You want to get to the heart of the story. You want to get to the heart of the characters. You want to, I mean, usually, I mean, if I've wanted to avoid them, I've just said pleasant cheese were exchanged and moving on. And then you get to, and there are times when you just say what's happening and then skip to a specific passage of, you know, obviously these people were talking before that, but here's what they're actually saying. And you're only chronicling certain parts of their dialogue. Lengthy speeches uh, within reason. I never liked the dialogue where you have to break it up with like there's a paragraph and then you leave it open-ended and then the next one you open it with the same quotes and then you go on and it's still the same character blabbing their head off 
uh, unless you got good reason, try to stay away from lengthy speeches. Try to stay away from information dropping. There was a Sherlock Holmes book I did here on audio that this is just a random example of me making up something, but the entire I think it was an hour and a half book was nothing but this. It was dialogue that read like, Holmes, why are you looking in that small gray box? Literally every description was within some line of dialogue and it was so distracting. <laughs> so this is why I recommend not doing that. I know it, it's a technique, but it is one that kind of is grating. And somebody says that I'm team all the above. Yes, exactly. Uh, he prefers dialogue ta action tags, but they can be overdone. Yes. So again, you want to mix everything in. It, I think at one point I put dialogue tags and other things in as the analogy of spice. You know, you, each one's a different one and you want to put in a good mix of them. You don't want to just put in 100% pepper, 100% thyme, 100% cinnamon, whatever. They all got their place, but not all at the same time. Uh, head hopping, we're talking about. Uh, so head hopping is, at least me, uh, my definition of it would be when you have another character's action or reaction sandwiched between the lines of a different character or different person's action or reaction to the original line. So there are examples, I think, in the book somewhere, but it's basically person one says something, person two reacts to it, person one says something else, but that's all one giant paragraph. Uh, those should be separate paragraphs. Multiple speakers in the same paragraph. Uh, that one I haven't seen too often. Grammar mistakes. Uh, early when I was deep reading a lot of the Vela's, I saw this mistake quite a bit. And I was like, did I miss something? Am I wrong? So I had to look it up and ask a few English teachers. Uh, but basically, I think it was just that particular author didn't know they were supposed to write dialogue a certain way. Um, but I saw people put a period in and then the end quote, and then he said was in capital, like actually its own separate little baby sentence, which is not the place for that. Annoying mistakes. So unnatural sounding dialogue, lack of contractions. Uh, lack of contractions goes to formality. Uh, a lot of us use contractions, but there are times to avoid it. Like I believe Nadine, uh, as a kid, tended not to use them. So a lot of the early books that I have that character in, she's, when you don't use contractions, you up your level of formality. So I wanted her to have a higher level of formality, so I tended to avoid a lot of contractions. Uh, making mistakes in accent, blend, um, in inserting accents, uh, mistrusting the reader. You don't wanna explain everything uh, that's in your line already because that just gets redundant. Putting AdWords everywhere, again, moderation. You can use them. They're not evil. They're just something to be used in a limited capacity. Excessive name dropping. That's when everything has the, the person's name within the line of dialogue. So like, Cheryl, would you like a cup of coffee? No, Sue, I would not like a cup of coffee. So. In that context, you're just replying to somebody who already presumably knows you. Uh, you do not want to be dropping their name every four seconds. And of course, appropriate use of punctuation. Uh, unless there's a really, really good reason for there to be a lot of excitement in a particular part, you want to limit your use of exclamation points. Uh, in internal dialogue is something you can present in several ways. How are we doing for time? At least a couple of seconds. Um, I shall, I think we're close to the end. Um, but I tend to, at least for first persons, if you, if one character is, I, I write from a limited third person or first person. So this works for me. It may not work for you if you write from more of a multiple characters or their perspectives are all wrapped up in this one thing. Uh, but internal dialogue to me then becomes an italics. So that's their thoughts. It's basically a line of dialogue that they're thinking just within their own head. If there's mental communication with somebody else, sometimes I'll go to italics and bold. And if there's multiple 
versions of that. Uh, I mix it up. Uh, some characters go bold, some will go bold and italics. And if there's any more than that, I think I've gone to bold italics and underlined. But after that, I've lost. So I just avoid scenes with more than that many people talking mentally. Um, so this is, I think we were talking about interruptions earlier, like way earlier. Uh, so this is just a quick example of how I would denote that. Uh, so this character saying, they can't keep me here. Ellie declares, I'm an American citizen and they're the American government, I finish. Pardoning my tone to bust through her picked headedness. So that interruption is, that's what I mean by interruption, that that is the end of that person's sentence because the next person is literally saying their line right on top of what would have been the rest of that first person's line. Do you say blah, blah, she thought when it's in internal thoughts? I tend not to. Um, I tend to, do I do that? Uh, so this actually does have an example of that. So guess I'll go quit now. What, no Ellie, this what, no Ellie, it's hard to see in this font, but that is actually just italics. That is the perspective character's line, but she never says it aloud. It's just her inner thoughts. I don't denote that that's a thought, but it is her thought. And then I usually have some sort of line, like the next one, spikes of alarm stab me in the chest, that indicates this came from this particular character. So I definitely acknowledge it in some way, but I rarely say she thought. Um, this is more example of Jess Turpy. Jess is the character in that last example. So she has multiple gifts. She's analytical, practical, but her style is casual and informal. Uh, she writes a lot of like book report kind of things. So she's sli also slightly irreverent. So, eh, nice to meet you too. Who peed in your tea this morning? Or uh, one of my favorite excerpts from one of the, the newer books is, lady, I've been threatened, drugged, tied to a bed and stabbed today. You really must work on your definition of reasonable. It sounds a whole lot better when the narrator does it. But the point is that these lines indicate a lot more informality and irreverence than they do uh, formality or sophistication, high levels. And this is an example from Nadine, Nadia. Uh, you can read that later. I think we're about out of time. Anyway, these lovely things, yep, uh, are the universal buy links and a book funnel link to the book. So if you scan that QR code, uh, you should have access to this presentation. Uh, if not, I will put it on the, I can PM it to you, or I'm supposing we're going to get a link somewhere. I don't know. But anyway, if you need a copy of the book, I can get you a copy of the QR code, uh, which is the book funnel one, which you can download at any point. Do you have any more questions? Some great questions were raised throughout the presentation, which I'm grateful for. So much better than talking to me, myself, and I. Uh, but you can always send me questions this way. This is a little bit about me and what I do. Besides, write lots of Vela episodes. This is my newsletter sign up again, lovely QR code. And if you want a dragon sticker on Hello Vela, you can go and I think you just have to put the next number, whatever it is, next comment number, and I will make some random drawings. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you all for coming. It's been lovely speaking with you. Um, if Wait, you have what, any- What questions. do we do on Hello Vella for, for these lovely stickers, since I also write dragons? <laughs> there's, um, there's a thread on there that is, I think it's pinned. So it should be next to the daily promo. And you have to make a comment on that that is just a number. So. If the okay. previous person wrote 16, you write 17 as your comments. And then I'm gonna stick those numbers, just use random number generator, okay. all 10 of them. And then I'll PM those people for their address and I'll mail out um, however many you choose. And, if only 10 people are Hella Hella, I will not in, send 10 out. What's up? Yeah. It's in, sorry about that. It's in Hellavella, not in the um, conference, not in the conference yes, it's one. in Hellavella. Okay. Um, I can put a duplicate one over there. There's no problem except i i'm not used to visiting to the, that other site i'm just used to <laughs> no it's fine it's fine <laughs> thank you
You're welcome. Thanks for coming. I guess I'll stop recording. Thanks now. for a great presentation.